Welcome everyone to this month's episode of Recovery Rockstar. My name is Melinda White. I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is that I haven't had to use a mood or a mind-altering substance since December 28th of 2011. It's a blessing every day to be able to wake up in my right mind and to be able to be of service to my fellows. And more than anything, to be able to be a small part of the solution that shares hope and promise to those who might still be struggling. So I have a very exciting guest that I can't wait to interview. One highlight I would like to say before is to highlight the recovery centers. In the state of Vermont, we have 12 recovery centers. Um, the, if people are looking for information on those centers, you can look at the Vermont Recovery Network. You can look at a center in your local community, in your county. The recovery centers provide peer recovery support services. They're also a recovery resource center, and they've got a lot of different options for housing, transportation, financial employment. They're connected to a lot of services in local communities to help anybody who is in recovery get connected to other services and basically gain more recovery capital. And that's the goal is to be able to increase our recovery capital. So that being said, I encourage people to look up your local recovery center, go and visit, check it out and share it with others. So I am extremely excited because I have been introduced to Prem Linsky, and this is our first time meeting in person, which is cool, but we've had a couple phone conversations and email conversations. And I'm really excited to hear about your journey. Uh, typically, I've said when we have people on the show that I may already know them through my local community or we've been connected in person, and that's not the case with you, which makes it a little bit more exciting because I am going to be learning about you at the same time as our listeners. Um, so first off, thank you for coming. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank and you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. You were super willing, and that's always exciting. Um, and I loved your energy with being able to share your story. So I'm going to start back a little bit about, tell me what your childhood was like, maybe where you grew up. Yeah, I grew up in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, a, um, a little suburb of Lowell. And I grew up as one of four children, lived with my parents up until I was 18 and been on pretty much traveling around since then. Have I think I've lived in like 30 places since then. So, wow. Yeah, really gotten around. Okay, wow. Well, that's exciting. I'm excited to hear about yeah. some of the 30 places. So when you look at, of course, you're a person in recovery, and in your younger years, approximately what age were you when you started experimenting or, or using or getting introduced to substances? 14 or so. Um, it went on and off through high school, but that yeah, was when I first started dabbling, I'll say. Yep. Yeah, which is common to yep. a lot of people we hear between the ages of like 13, 16, some younger, some older, but that seems to be a common theme. Yep. Um, was it kind of, was it like experimenting? It was. Yeah, it was just very experimental, like, oh, we got this, like, let's try it, or yep. I've heard about this, let's give it a go. Yeah. And then did you ever find that, at, like, in your high school years, did you find that you got to a point where you started feeling dependent, or was that not the case for you? Not so much in high school. Um, I probably used food more as like um, an escapism, you know, model for me. And I was just like, would either not eat for days or or overeat other times. But I feel like that was more um, what I was using at the time. Right, yeah. right. That's so common too. It's interesting because as we, once we get in recovery, we learn so much about addiction, right? And it's not even about whether it's a drug or alcohol or food or money or, you know, there's so many different things that we use to access to change how we're feeling. So it's just interesting because that's a common occurrence for many people I speak to in my own journey too, where having an eating disorder was very present in younger years. So yeah, it was something I could control. Right? Exactly, right? That makes sense. So once you ended up getting, as you grew in years, when did you find a stage that you were starting to, to dabble with substances and it was becoming a little bit of an issue? Once I was out of my house on my own, um, yeah, probably at 18, within, within the first year of living on my own, it definitely, yeah, became a huge issue pretty quick. No supervision from the <laughs> right, parents. Right. Gotcha. So once you kind of had like free, it was free for all, yeah, you yep. found that's when you were drawn more. What did you find that you were being drawn to? The escape, yeah, definitely the more I look at it, it's like I'm, I definitely like to escape from reality. Escape from myself was a big part of it. And just I found that substance, substances, like maybe I thought in my head, like I'm using this for fun, this is fun. But I was really just like trying to get away from reality, trying to get away from um, maybe things within myself that I wasn't willing to take a look at. Right, very common as well. And something we don't tend to realize at the time right. 
but in reflecting back, it's clear as day to see. So what, what substances did you find that you were becoming dependent on? Alcohol was always an issue. Whenever I started drinking, I would drink until I threw up. Yeah. Um, I never really enjoyed it. So that tells me that there was a problem as right. I was using it just because it was a great way um, to get out of myself really quick. Um, I always had a love for psychedelics. Yeah. Like no better way to get out of my reality uh, than to use psychedelics. And yep. while it started off as a very fun and playful thing, it it definitely would become an issue pretty quickly. Uh, there were definitely years of my life I don't remember like where like three, four, five times a week I was using psychedelics along with other substances, which uh, looking back, that was the bigger issue for me was like right. making these cocktails for myself and finding myself like, oh, that causes a seizure. I shouldn't, I shouldn't yeah. do that next time. <laughs> and then like, oops, I did that again. Like, oh, silly right. me, you know. So you started seeing some like adverse medical reactions. Yes, to yeah. To using the substances. Did you ever get in any trouble of any, any kind? I was arrested in White River Junction um, in a car. Um, I was smoking weed with mushrooms in the passenger seat and very quickly found myself in handcuffs. Yikes. Yeah, so uh, that's about it for, not that it was like something small, but yeah. Right, was that, do you feel like, so you mentioned having a seizure, negative uh, medical effects, and then also having been arrested. Right. When those things happened, did you, was it on your radar that maybe you had a substance use issue or was it more about, I got to learn how to do this and get away with it? Yeah, yeah, fly under the radar was definitely what I was thinking. It's like, well, first off, I don't want my friends to know. I, I felt bad that like my friends, I had one friend who's seen me have like three seizures and like a couple of overdoses. And I just was like, okay, how can I hide this? from that person. How can I have like my family not know that I'm getting arrested? Uh, there were right. plenty of like stop signs that it should have been like great warning signs. But for me at the time, I was like, oh, okay, I just got to change what I'm doing. Like, right. this isn't work. It's clearly like, isn't working when I do it this way. So like, let me try this other alternate approach. It's, it's just interesting to me because no matter who I talk to, it's so common that in the beginning when there's those negative effects, that denial that we have built within us is not looking at, well, this is a problem. Maybe I should look at it and stop. We look at, I've got to get better at this and not get caught or bother other people with it. So it's Fun just so game. common. Our, uh, yeah, like our, our, the peers that we, you know, that we have, seems like even if it's different scenarios, we go through the same emotions. You know, it's such a similar sequence of what happens before we hit a bottom. Right. For you, what did it look like when you got to a point that you had hit a bottom enough to decide, I think I need to change something? When a lot of longtime friends of mine cut me out of their life, when uh, my older sister, who I was really close with, stopped talking to me when I'd come around, she just like didn't want to have a conversation with me. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back now, she just knew I was high all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and losing like a girlfriend mm -hmm. was a big thing. And Eventually, like all of these things, I was like, oh, so I'm not an island. You know, every decision I make affects all of these other people and they're fed up. Right. You know, and um, yeah, overdosing, a suicide attempt yeah. or two or yeah, a few. You yeah. Know, um, yeah. And just like really coming to after a suicide attempt once, maybe overdose suicide attempt. And it was just kind of like this like moment of clarity. Um, and I know the Buddha talks about like, we get that like right thinking for like a moment in our life. And it was just this moment of like, oh yeah, I'm going to die. Like, and like, I'm actually going to die. And I don't, and I'm the, like the person within me that I knew was there. That was like a great person. I've been covering up for years and like, I need to let that person like show themselves again. Right, right. So you, you realize that you had lost who you truly are inside. Yeah. And in that moment realize like, I need to get that person back. Yeah, there's all the extrinsic things like family members, friends, but that like intrinsic motivation is, a, it, it's essentially what does it for people. It's like, that's what's gonna make the long-term change. Right. And we talk about like people enabling, like well, when you have people enabling, like that's, that's make, um, like keeping them down that path. But mm -hmm. when that person f like fully recognizes within themselves that like, oh, I, I'm not who I wanna be, right. you know? Um, and that wasn't the last day I used, for sure. Yep. <laughs> but, it's usually processed, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. it's not the end event, but at least it sounds like that's kind of the start of the event. Right. Um, and then it's one of those things where it's like, you don't know who you are anymore. 
and that feeling is really, really dark and empty and scary. Yeah. So did you go to a treatment of some sort or did you get connected with a person or what was, what did it look like when you kind of made that decision to take an action towards getting help? I quit my job. I moved to Vail, Colorado. Oh my. <laughs> and I worked as a lift operator. Wow. <laughs> um, I just, in my mind, I need to get away from here. This is the problem. I need, you know, right. so I, I packed up and like I always did, I moved away from, ran for my problems. I'm great at that. And I showed up there and within like two weeks, I, I tried to kill myself again because I just mm -hmm. kept relapsing and trying to get clean and relapsing and, and realizing like, oh, I can't do this on my own. A uh, really close old friend of mine was living in Denver at the time, came to visit me one night and over a six pack of beer, he's like, you should go to a meeting. Wow. And yeah, within wow. like two or three days, that, that was what I did. I, I packed it up and yeah, somebody once, somebody said to me, they're like, you, you should just try it and go to a meeting. And I, it was really snowy day in Colorado and I walked out my front door and I knew like a meeting I think is that way and the liquor store is that way and I just like was like I'm gonna give it I, this doesn't work I'm gonna try this and I met my sponsor that night wow that is amazing so you you searched you did the geographical cure which never works because right. wherever you go there you are yeah right and then you took that suggestion at the crossroads to either go to the package store or to a meeting and that was your first meeting first meeting and what did that what did that feel like Everybody was really welcoming. It felt good. I was definitely nervous walking in with somebody like called me out right away and was just like, could you, like, why are you here? You know, like in a very friendly way, just like your first meeting, like what's going on? And right away, my, at the end of the meeting, my sponsor, my future sponsor walked right up to me and he's like, we're going to another meeting. Like, wow. let's go. And I was like, oh, I think I have stuff to do. And he's like, no, no, it's like, <laughs> it's like Friday night. Like you're coming with us. And we broke down on the side of the road in like a oh, canyon. No. And like, the, I saw shooting stars that night. I was with like two oh. other people in recovery. And it was just like, like, okay, something feels right. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it was like the start of like a really great journey. That is awesome. So you continue to go to meetings. Yep. You met the person who was your sponsor. Yep. And then did you stay, in, how long did you stay in Colorado for? For about a year. Um, I worked the steps with him. It was really great and really difficult experience, but it was yeah. really good. I moved to Hawaii for a few months. Of course you did. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, uh, the summer it ended and I was like, okay, I got a job in in Colorado somewhere, and I got accepted to go live on a farm in Hawaii, and I was like, oh, let's go try something new, nice. you know, and, and I thought it would be beneficial for me to get away from um, this, like, recovery, like, bubble I had created. I knew, like, I was I was throwing myself within something, and I, I knew I needed to almost test the waters. Right. So I went to Hawaii for a few months and met um, my guru, my teacher, a spiritual teacher, who's an old sadhu monk in India, and gave me the name Prem, and from that point on, it was just like, that's when my spiritual journey started as like a follower and a, um, a, t a student. I became a really good student at that point, and it's like that also, yeah, my life just continued to like snowball into like, and not in a negative way, it was like such a positive yeah. way. It's amazing how, you know, we hear sometimes, whether it's through a 12-step program or other peers in recovery, how we just have to do the next right thing and just not pick up for that day. Right. And what our journey is becomes more evident. Like we know what we're supposed to do. We understand purpose more and what our purpose is and being connected. And I love how you've highlighted you had the connection to a person who is your sponsor and then a connection to your spiritual advisors, yeah. if, if that's what you call a mentor, like a person who helps you really put some stuff into practice and a commitment there. So you worked on that, like the combination of, you know, putting down the substance reaching out for somebody who can tangibly give you some suggestions and then also tapping inside within yourself to, to get that strength, to get that power. So what did you find happened after Hawaii? Moved back to Colorado, um, had a great winter snowboarding with friends, and, and I eventually had that spring moved back to Massachusetts to help my mom take care of my little sister we had adopted. And I was like, it was good, like everything happens for a reason. It ended up being a terrible decision um, in some aspects. I, I relapsed after 18 months. Um, I started doing substances I had never tried before um, and almost died a few times. Wow. And, and after just 
like I knew I knew the solution, right? You know, you know yeah. the solution, but I had tapped into like that addictive personality, and I just like I just it was constantly like relapse recovery, relapse recovery, overdose, you know, like mm-hmm. back and forth. And it wasn't until like after Christmas, a friend of mine that I used to work with called me and was like, "Hey, this older gentleman had a stroke up in Georgia, Vermont, down the road. He needs a caretaker. Whoa, like he loves you. He looks up to you. Like, would you come and take care of him?" And I did, and like, um, he's a beautiful man, and he just like gave me this like space where I could serve somebody. Yeah. So that brought me like a lot of joy and happiness to be able to be of service to somebody, and I was able to focus on myself. Right. And that I, I've been clean since then, and that was like such a beautiful moment in my life where I could really, yeah, it was that two. It was a balance, you know, the balance that we always talk about. It's like I was able to be of service and serve myself. Right. And in that, I, I started running. I started being like taking health like very seriously, both with food and um, physically. And since then, I've become like an ultra endurance athlete. Like, yeah, been traveling the the world, essentially doing like ultra endurance events. I, That's I'm awesome. an ultra marathon runner, and wow, like, and I do service work for a living. So just to see how it all just switched so quick. Again, just another moment where I said yes instead of no, where I said like, this seems to be the light, you know, it's like compared to that dark road. So I just kept following that. I love how you had said too that, you know, nothing happens without a reason and how, again, in hindsight, you're able to see, like you really learned from the times that you did come back in this area and then you kind of fell. You learned from that too. And I think sometimes it's not uncommon that, We know, we know that if we relapse, that's, you know, putting us in bad direction. But yet there's that kind of that idea that, well, I've got enough recovery that I would never let it get as bad as it was. And then we end up in a worse place. A lot of the not yets end up happening. And yet getting back in recovery again, how you're able to recognize that it's not like you lost the time that you had either, right? right? Like we maintain all of that knowledge and that wisdom that we got. It's just when we're feeding one wolf more than the, you know, are we going to feed the wolf today? Or are we going to re- feed the recovery? And by feeding the wolf and having those negative experiences, you learn from them yeah. and look at how much more you've skyrocketed into a healthier lifestyle. So it's just beautiful to see how, you know, while there are places that I'm not even going to say that you fell per se, but, you know, right. some tripping involved, you know, we have a couple of backslides. And yet those, I think, are part of our journey because I also had yeah. some relapses and kind of wish they didn't happen, but yet... I am grateful they did because I was finally convinced to my core and understood how nothing, I can't use anything safely. Um, So whereabouts are you living now? I live in Moncton. I live off the grid in a little, little, little micro home. Um, Yeah, just like no power, no water, no heat really. Just like, I, I enjoy that. You know, I get to live alone in the woods and it's a really beautiful place surrounded by trees. Oh, so I can nature. like go home at the end of a crazy day of work and just, you know, reconnect with nature, which I found is is like a huge part of my recovery. Yep. Yep. And so I mean that obviously it sounds like to you where your home is, that's your serenity. That's where you get peace and serenity and that's essential. That yeah. soundness of mind. And then somebody mentioned to me too something about a documentary that you were part of. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, a wonderful friend of mine, Phil LaCroix, who's lives in Bolton, Vermont, uh just got in touch with me one day. He had been talking about uh wanting to run the long trail mm-hmm. to raise money for I, um, sober housing in Vermont and just like raise awareness of opiate addiction in Vermont. And as an ultra runner, I was like, great, I'll do as much of it as I can with you. And I did, I think I was, I did about half the trail with him oh and it was goodness. just, I thought he hated me by the end because I'm <laughs> like the, like, let's go, let's do this. You know, right. I'm, I'm definitely always like the motivator and I, I, yeah, I just, I like, and really enjoy pushing myself. And I really get a kick out of pushing other people too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we had a really great time and it was just a really great experience for me to feel like what I was doing was benefiting other people. Um, and he raised like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and still raising money. The documentary just got aired for the first time. It's called No Easy Mile at yeah. Arts Riot. And it was great to you know see that footage and then to be able to be in a Q&A panel after and to be able to talk a little bit about my story and to be able to hear from other people in the audience about um, how opiate addiction 
it has affected and impacted their lives. Right. So it was like a really great conversation. So to be a part of that was really wonderful. That's so amazing. And that was the piece that, you know, when it was relayed to me that by the woman who connected us and she mentioned that documentary, it's like, how heartwarming is it that the efforts you're putting in are going into helping others and especially with recovery residences, because we know that there's a shortage in the state of Vermont for sure. And to see that kind of effort and at the same time being part of that, it just enhances your own recovery. I just love that. I think it's amazing. Tell me a little bit about what are kind of your daily commitments related to recovery daily or weekly commitments that you feel are what help you stay strong in your recovery? Yeah, a uh, service. So I am the program manager at a local nonprofit in Burlington. We work with kids like 16 to 24 years old that have dropped out of high school. We work with them to get job skills. We work with them to get their diploma. We do service in the community. It's an AmeriCorps program. So I've just taken this like idea of service and just run with it. Like it's, I realized a long time ago that I don't want to work for just a paycheck. It's just not fulfilling to me. Um, And it's, yeah, it just doesn't bring me that joy. At the end of the day, I'm like, oh, what am I, I'm working for just myself and I don't like that. So to be able to do work that impacts the lives of the youth of Vermont, essentially we have kids coming from all over to be part of the program is great. I get to challenge myself Mm-hmm. In a I'm sure. Whole new way. I'm sure. <laughs> Every day, I'm just like, whoa, this is, you know, so different from where I thought I would ever be. Like, I never thought I would get to the place I am today. I'm back in school because, which took me a long time to do because I, I'd like apply to a school and they're just like, your grades are terrible. And I was like, oh, that class, I used to go at class on acid. Right, <laughs> when I, right. No when wonder I took that terrible. class, like, I remember that now. Like, yeah. that was a weird class. And then um, <laughs> other class I just dropped out of and just like terrible grades. And then, I mean, it also was that like perpetuating thing of I thought I was dumb. You know, I'd go through high school, struggle through it, struggle through college. And it wasn't until I found like I was... Um, In recovery, I did disaster response work in other countries. Like I lived in Fiji, Nepal, India, like rebuilding schools, homes and stuff. And I got into construction and I was like, oh, this all makes sense. Like you give me a piece of paper, like I'm not, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right. But you get me outside and we're like calculating roof pitch and stuff. It just makes more sense. Like I'm a kinesthetic learner. Yeah. So to be able to give that to my students is great. That is so amazing, too, because we hear that, you know, one of the new slogans, we hear so many slogans in recovery, and the opposite of addiction is connection, whereas it used to be the opposite of addiction is recovery. Well, now we say it's connection, and it what you're doing with these young people is what is being identified as needed to prevent people from having a substance use disorder. It's yeah. like we got to get the focus off the substances so much and the focus on connecting with young people and having them challenge themselves and find a purpose and, and recognize their talents and recognize that, you know, we can't do it all. And the more that we can focus on, because like you were saying, even with your grades, well, I thought maybe that I had a problem because I my, my grades were bad. And yet it's like, but wait a minute. So today, if you're saying I want to further my education, you showed up, you're willing, let's work with that. And we, you know, let's focus on what are your strengths and enhance those. And for you personally, right. like, holy cow, your strengths are amazing. Like, I'm just listening to your story and what you've done. And what a powerful example, especially for a young person to be connected right. with you. And I think it's good, like, we we do, like, check-ins at work with our students. And, and I'll go out and run, like, 100-miler <laughs> ultra marathon races just like on wow. on a whim on the weekend and I think it's really beneficial like on Friday to be like oh I'm gonna go run this 100 miler this weekend and come in on Monday like last fall I was like I failed my first race like I didn't finish and I'm like speaking about this right like I did not come in today I'm not gonna not talk about it like it happened right. and it was right. very real and it was wonderful like yeah. <laughs> that was good I learned a lot you know and I think to be able to to share that with somebody is good because then when they have a, a failure, it's mm-hmm. not really a failure. Like we were talking about like our slip ups, they're not really right. failures. They're growing lessons. So exactly. they can, I think like being a mentor, it's like, how am I, how am I letting my students see like how I perceive things so they can see it that way? Like everything, we can look at everything positively or negatively. Right. So they get to see like, they have so, like struggle getting into school in the morning. And I'm like, I was up at 4.30. Like I swam a mile and a half this morning or I went on a long run because like I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with like hating myself, not wanting to get out of bed. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's like that alarm goes off. Like I'm getting up and I'm going because 
Like, there's a demon inside my head. I'm aware of this. And mm-hmm. um, a friend of mine put it best when he said, like, I kept trying to, to, like, move away from this demon and get it out of my head. But eventually I woke up and was like, this demon is a part of me, so I'm going to make it pay rent. There you go. And, like, <laughs> for me, it's, like, like going all night long at an ultra marathon, like, middle of the night, just you and, like, the trail. Yeah, you know, I just love it. grueling through the miles. It's, like, yeah. I do things that I sign up for races I don't think I can finish. I sign up for, for events that I don't think I can finish. And when you cross that finish line, it's like, oh, yeah, I can oh. do this. Yeah. That is amazing. I just love it. And I love how you're you're saying for the kids, you're basically you're leading by example. Right. You're not just encouraging them of different things that they could do that would be great, but you're living that and you're leading by example. And that is so powerful. And I love the philosophy that you don't, I like to say you never lose. Like we never lose. Right. We win or we learn something. We never lose. So it's like having that that view on it that there's always something to learn and grow from. So I wish I could talk to you for like hours because you are awesome. Um, I, we do have to wrap up. And do you have any kind of last word or slogan or message you'd like to give to the viewers? Um, yeah, just to tie back to the point that Phil was making about needing more, and we talked about here, but needing more sober housing in, in Vermont. Like as somebody who's never, um, I never went to rehab. I figured it out through friends. Like I understand everybody's got their path. What helped me was a friend of mine in Colorado when I was down and out gave uh, put a bed in his basement of his sober house yeah. so that I had a place to sleep that was safe where people would hold me accountable. So I think it's really important to know that like sober housing in Vermont is very limited. Um, studies show that we need at least double the beds around Vermont and around the country. Um, so just write a letter to your representative, like call your representative or... Um, donate to one of the wonderful organizations around Burlington that do, in Vermont as a whole, that have sober housing because it's really beneficial. Because it's a it's an epidemic. It's it's affecting people all over the country, and there are certain things that we need to do about. It. Like you were saying, like Narcan, like right. there are lots of things in the stigma. It's like we have this negative stigma about people in in um, in recovery and that are in active addiction, and I think that's a huge part of the problem. Like. I, for a long time, struggled to talk about it, but Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until that documentary recently that I was like, oh, right, I have a voice, and it's really important to share it, Um, and I get to share it. I don't share it all all the time with my students, but when I find out a student has an issue, it's like that, that like, great moment where I have to pull them aside and be like, here, like, four and a half years clean, like, I've struggled. I know what it's like, you know? I love it. Let's have that conversation. You rock, Prem. I appreciate you you. so much. Thank you so much for watching. I wish we could talk to you all day long. You are amazing. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next month on Recovery Rockstar. Have a great night.